Welcome again to a short stop with a short stop. As we begin today, I want to give a shout out to Caleb Sampson, Paul Sperlin, and John Podine. They are heavily involved with the Ministry League. And if you don't have the Ministry League app, you need to get it because it has so many resources, not only for your Bible study, for singing, uh, for a lot of different things that you can use the ministry, ministry League app for. And I suggest that, that you get it. But I just wanted to say hi, guys, and let you all know that you were the three that talked me into doing this podcast. And I thank you very much for that. When I was in college, or not in college, but I was coaching college baseball, I was with the University of Pikeville. We were playing the University of Moorhead. And uh, we were ahead of them five to two in about the third or fourth inning. And I have my leadoff hitter on first base. And I give him the steal sign and he steals. About the time that he slides into the base, the ball gets there the ball hits the shortstop's glove. As he goes to make the tag, the ball goes flying out into center field. And as the ball is laying out there, the umpire goes, he's out. And I knew that wasn't right. And I, I went out and started talking to the umpire. And, and uh, he told me that he that put the tag on him and, and the ball didn't have to stay in his glove as far as that was concerned. But I got a little hot. I raised my voice. Uh, and he didn't like what I was saying, and, and he kicked me out of the game. Uh, so I had to go up and sit in the stands. He allowed me to go up and sit in the stands because I didn't have an assistant coach, and it was going to be my kids down there coaching uh, the team. So he allowed me to go up and sit in the stands. It got a little chippy out there with the kid that stole the base and the shortstop and got all that broken up. And then a couple of innings later in the game, the same kid's on first base. And he ends up still in second base this time. And when he's on second, uh, he and the shortstop got a little chippy with each other again. But the kid that stole second base, his brother was on the team. And all of a sudden, he just darts out of the dugout and is out there. And, and the next thing you know, both benches have emptied. Uh, so I had to get out of the stands. I'm back out on the field. We get everybody separated, nobody's fighting, everything is good. But I'm starting to talk with that umpire again. And I raise my voice again. And all of a sudden, he throws me out of the game for the second time. And when the game is finally over, the head coach for Moorhead University walked over to me. He said, I just want you to know, you set an OVC record. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're in the books. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're the only person that's ever been kicked out of the same game twice. But there was another incident in the big leagues. Uh, I was out at shortstop, and there's a guy stealing uh, from the St. Louis Cardinals. And he slides into the base. The ball's thrown into me perfectly. I put the tag on him before he gets to the bag. But the umpire calls him safe. And Frank Robinson was the manager. And he's walking out to where the umpire's at, and about he gets about five feet away from the umpire. And the umpire looked at Frank, and he said, Frank, I blew it. Frank never said a word. He just turned around and walked straight on back into the dugout. Now with me, when I was at Pipeville College at Moorhead, I shouldn't have raised my voice. Uh, I shouldn't have done it the first time. I shouldn't have done it the second time. I should have heard what the umpire had to say and then done like Frank Robinson did and just turn around and walk away. I don't, I, I've never cussed an umpire. Uh, when I was younger, yes, I did. I cussed. Uh, but when I became a Christian, uh, I, I put those things away. When I was younger, I thought that, that uh, what a man, when you got to be a man, that's, that's what you did. But as I became a Christian, I understood that it took more of a man not to cuss than it did. And if you would turn with me to James chapter 1 and verse 26. 
It says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religious is worthless. If you consider yourself a religious person, you're still using all kinds of four-letter words. People around you are not going to take you seriously as being a religious person. And you need to bridle your tongue. And we all need to bridle our tongue. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses, uh, verse 13, they also learn to be idle. As they go around from house to house, not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking, talking alone, things not proper uh, for our retention. What is gossip? Gossip is a sin. And we should never ever be going around from house to house or person to person telling a story. But how can we stop gossip? It has to stop with us. Whenever somebody is gospel, they come and tell us something. We do not go to another person and, and repeat the same story because gossip can get misconstrued that you're not even telling the truth. So if you see gossip coming around, we need to be the ones that stop it. In James chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, now if we put the bits in the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet boasts of great things. See how great the forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity, the tongue is set among us, our members, as that which defiles the entire body and sets the fire on course of our life and is sealed by the fire of hell. For every species of beast and bird and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. We can see that a horse can be guided by a bit in its mouth. We can see that a great ship can be guided by just a little rudder in the back of it. We can make it go the way that we want it to go. Just a very small spark can cause a whole forest to be burnt down. This reading here tells us that the tongue cannot be tamed, but I believe that it can be controlled. And how do we control it? In James chapter 1 and verse 19, it tells us to be slow to speak and quick to hear. And that is how we can control our tongue. If we use our two ears to listen before we speak and think about the words that we're gonna say, then the words that are gonna come out are gonna be a lot uh, more refreshing to people than if we don't think about what we're gonna say. And people will respect that. We need to think before we talk. Because once the words get out, we can't take them back. Parents, let me give you a hypothetical. Moms and dads, listen to this. If a couple, a young married couple came and knocked on your door and said, we're going to move in with you. And you said, okay. Then the next morning, that couple walks downstairs. Your kids are sitting on the couch in the middle of the living room. And all of a sudden, these two People that just moved in, we just started cussing up a storm. Every four-letter word that you could possibly think of. And your kids sitting right there on this couch. Okay, they finally stop. They go back upstairs. Then the next morning, they walk downstairs. And they are completely naked. They are naked as a jaybird. And your kids are sitting on the couch right in your living room. How long are you going to put up with that? I don't think you would put up with it for a second. But let me ask you, what are you allowing your kids to watch on TV? Because there's so many four-letter words now that are being uh, broadcasted on TV, it's unbelievable. 
so much nudity that's on TV now that it's unbelievable. Are you allowing that TV uh, to influence them? Or are you curtailing what they watch and what they're allowed to, to listen to, especially when it comes to their music? What about their phones or their iPads or uh, uh, the computers that they use? You need to have structure with it. What about husbands and wives? Ephesians 5.25 tells husbands to love your wives as Christ loved the church as he gave himself up for it. Do you husbands and wives ever fight? Do I ever get into it with my wife? Sure, I do. Don't want to, but, I don't, but every once in a while it happens. Who's supposed to take care of that? It's the husband, because he's the leader of the home. Uh, sometimes we got to put our tails between our legs and go in and say we're sorry, even if we didn't start it. We've got to try to get the household back the way that it's supposed to be. I remember a, an elder that I served with here, Brother Frank Webb, uh, and he told me when I first became an elder, he, he and his wife have never had an argument. I said, Brother Frank, you've got to be kidding me. He said, no, nope, we've never had an argument. I said, how do you keep from it? He said, well, when she gets mad at me, I just walk out of the room. So we've, he says it always takes two to argue. And they had never had an argument their whole life. So if we get in an argument of husbands and wives, try to keep it sensible, try to keep it uh, on, a, on a, a good level and empty it as quickly as possible. In Acts chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, what should we be speaking about? Uh, what should our tongues never rest from? Peter and John have been arrested here in Acts chapter 4. The Sadducees and the priests didn't like them speaking about Jesus Christ, and they tried to shut them up for it. But as, as we look in verses 18 through 20, it says this, And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Where it whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed, rather than to God you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. We cannot stop speaking about Jesus Christ. That's what we need to use our tongues for. We need to always try to have the example of Christ, but the words that come out of our mouths should be Christ-like also. If I've stepped on anybody's toes here, I want you to know that I've missed my mark, I've missed my aim, because I'm aiming straight for the center of your heart. James chapter 1 and verse 19 again. Be slow to speak, but quick to hear. And if we do that, we can take care of our speech problems in every form, fashion that we can think of. And we can always have Christ-like words coming out of our mouths. Next week, we're going to be talking about the right equipment. I'm going to show you a bat that I got from Reggie Jackson, and I'm going to show you a glove that I got from Pee Wee Reese. One of them we use on the offensive side, the other one we use on the defensive side. But we're going to talk about the equipment of God. Thank you again for being with us. This is just another short stop with a shortstop.